I will call the Blackstone Millville Regional School District School Committee meeting for October 14th to order. If you could please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll do introduction of members. I'm Patty Sacco, I'm from BMR. Amanda Gilmain from Millville. Aaron Binaco, Millville. Tim Hill, Tim Howell, Blackstone. Carrie Gaudet, Blackstone. Sarah Williams, Blackstone. Madison Marshawn, Blackstone. Matt Aaronworth, Assistant Superintendent. Jason DeFalco, Superintendent. Thank you. And we'll move to our student rep reports. We're happy to have you back for your second meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. Um, so for sports, JV football won their second game last week. Seniors game start yet started yesterday with soccer. Tomorrow is volleyball and field hockey. Volleyball ne officially made it to their playoffs during their for the first time in their like career since they've been started. And for homecoming was a success on the 31st of September. Around 230 students attended and the weather was nice outside and it seemed everyone had a good time. And then I'd like to shed light on a new class that Miss Conti, a history teacher at the high school, put together. And it's called Food for Thought. And it's basically taking like food that can be shared among like all people and incorporating it into different aspects of history. So like culture and heritage and like feeding a crowd, psychology. Last, mm, I believe two weeks, October 5th. We put together a tacos for teachers during the lunch period. And we made everything from scratch. We made homemade tortillas, homemade guacamole, salsa. We made beef, everything you could imagine for tacos. And we fed about 37 teachers. And overall, the feedback was good. And also during the teacher meeting that they had yesterday, we made like fall baked goods. I think the class is really good and everyone seems to like enjoy it. And it's a different way to like look at school through like food where I think everyone loves food. You might not be the best at cooking it. <laughs> I think <laughs> overall you like it. <laughs> and then NHS met Wednesday morning and we're planning for a booth at the fall festival. And that's at Roosevelt Park. And then student council had their first meeting. And we're currently planning Powder Puff, which we weren't able to have last year, but we're able to have this year. And Fall Conference is coming up in October. No, nope, November. <laughs> and that's really exciting because last year all events were virtual. And this year it will be held at Oxford. And we'll get to go to a bunch of different leadership conventions and just meet new people from around our region. And then GSA is holding a solidarity conference which is kind of like fall conference but it addresses like different topics such as like privilege being a bystander body image issues and I think that's a great way to like incorporate our community with different communities around the Blackstone area and that's going to be held at BMR. Great. Any questions for our student reps? Tim? What time are the games tomorrow? Tomorrow, field hockey is at 3.30 and volleyball is at 5. Thank you. Oh. And those are both home, home games yep, for the seniors. Okay. Um, any other questions? I have one. Do, is there a playoff schedule for volleyball yet? or so is that... We haven't gotten our schedule yet, but we know it starts after Halloween. Okay. Will there be any home games for... I'm players. not sure. I'm pretty, I'm thinking there probably will be. Okay. Just depends on how far we get into playoffs. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you, Thank you very much for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, one other question. Sure. When's our next band competition? Saturday. This I'm, Saturday? Yes. And where's that located? I'm not quite sure. It's in Cranston. It's in Cranston. <laughs> 
Okay. There, there, it starts at 6 p.m. and our band is scheduled for 8 p.m. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome to stay or um, go home and do homework. <laughs> I was going to stay and I have to leave because of other priorities, All right. but I will stay. Thank next you time. for being here. <laughs> Did you pull the short straw? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you can dismiss yourself at any time. Okay. You can't excuse yourself. <laughs> All right, so moving on, we have a quorum and we can um, approve our consent agenda A, which is warrants minutes of meeting for September 16th. Um, any motion for? There was one error on the agenda. The minutes, um, I believe the 16th, I think we already did those. Where either we did them or they're not in the packet. I couldn't. I That's the wrong date. Okay. I'm not that. sure. It's so we'll exclude the minutes yeah, is that, is and that just okay? approve totally. warrants. Okay. Right. So I'm looking for a motion to approve warrants for motion. Okay. I'll second. Motion made by Amanda and second by Tim. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. And we also have public forum now. I'm not sure if anyone needs to speak to us. You might be on the agenda later anyway. <laughs> um, all right, and moving on, do we want to skip? Do you want to go to Matt first and wait for Jane? Or sure, do you want to? Do that. Okay. If that's okay with you. We're going to, if it's okay with the rest of the committee, we're going to move to report of the business office. And we'll go back to report of the superintendent and our school committee items. Um, just because there's a lot of information packed in there. And I believe we have two um, additional members on their way. So Matt, it's all yours. Certainly. Uh, it's, it's a rare treat to go first, so I appreciate <laughs> the opportunity. Um, if you look at the total revenue report in your package, um, everything is being collected smoothly. We're getting all of our expected funds. Um, no hiccups to date. Um, again, some of the grants still have not had their initial issuance, so you'll see um, some of them we've not collected anything. However, the state releases those funds and they do an initial disbursement and then that's when we can start drawing down. The only thing worth noting on the revenue uh, report is that our Medicaid program revenue, I'm now anticipating that it will be almost at if not higher than what it is that we budgeted uh, they recently released information that they're going to allow the districts to add administrative claims that were associated to uh, covid related costs for services that were provided through um, the pandemic so they're going to be providing districts with more uh, reimbursement from medicaid so that will be very helpful any questions about the revenues Okay. Uh, if you look at the general fund expenditure review, you can see that there's nothing, again, we're still relatively early in the, in the school year. Um, there's nothing that's standing out. Um, you will notice that there are some, some red numbers in places. Um, some of that is because we budgeted that money in one spot and it now is being expended we are just expending it from a different line um, but for the most part if you look at the totals which is on the second page um, and you go through the summary of the the various functions the 1000s 2000s and 3000s you can see that we're in the black and everything right now and we're not expecting to run into the red at all in any respect <coughs> Any questions about the general funds? If, yes, please. Yeah. One out of 9,300 non-public programs. Uh, Can you give me an idea what those might be? Yeah, absolutely. That is the um, out-of-district placements. I, um, I had mentioned that. I didn't mention it again um, because I had put it in an earlier report. That negative 271 will be offset um, on, the grant, on the grant funding expenditure. If you take a look at the circuit breaker, 
on fund code 28. That circuit breaker where you see the current available balance is 254,000. Um, that's, that's funds that we actually put toward the um, out of district costs. So that looks like a big red number in the, in the out of district, but we reimburse that account through the circuit breaker fund and also through some of the title one funding for, for okay, cause I, I'm looking here and I, I see the, um, the, the light purple. Uh, I'm terrible with colors. Yeah. I see the 278 on the grant funding mm -hmm. and then under the available money 254. Mm -hmm. And when I look back at the general fund revenue or the general fund expenditures for 271.62 in the whole. That's just based on what's encumbered. Um, that is a significantly low amount considering the expenses for the special education programs. And um, this circuit breaker amount that's budgeted is actually a conservative budgeting amount for circuit breaker. So we are actually anticipating getting in more than the 533,000. Um, okay, so the 278, does that include the, the 271 that's I'm looking at the grant. No, funds. right now. So right now, we we encumber funds for mm -hmm. out of district placements yes. either from the ninety three hundred line or from the circuit breaker fund. Um, we we target specific placements with the circuit breaker fund, um, so those are encumbered, but there's still a, an available balance in the circuit breaker fund. So as we move along in the year we just shift the money from the circuit breaker. We actually, we shift the expenses from the 9,300 funds to the circuit breaker funds. And they, they end up balancing out. I do not foresee us going into the red with respect to our out of district placements this year. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Um, worth noting on the grant fund expenditures, um, you'll see that on the bottom of the sheet, I added the ESSER II and ESSER III grants that we're gonna be receiving. The ESSER II grant, I just wanna be clear, that is for just this year. That's not the total of our ESSER II funds. That, again, if people remember, that grant is split over two years and that's just one year of those funds. Similarly, the ESSER III is one year of three years of funding. So that's approximately a third in the ESSER three of, of the total funding that we're gonna be getting, but it is what we allocated for this year. Um, the ESSER two grant, when that came in, we actually budgeted for using the ESSER two grant. So you can see all the way to the right where it says offsets. That will show you the function code that it offsets, which is the um, general education teachers. That's where we, applied those ESSER II funds for some of the interventionists and other uh, positions that we were funding through the budget. The ESSER III is not uh, indicated to offset anything because we added additional pieces after we had budgeted when we found out we were receiving the ESSER III. So the ESSER III positions, they're not in the budget. They're just separate that we identified as services that we will provide through ESSER III. Are there any questions about the grant funding expenditure? I also have my personnel update that is included in your package. Um, you can take a look at that. If you have any questions, you can certainly email myself or Monique. And moving to the facilities updates. Um, Right now, the baseball and softball fields are looking pretty good. We did remove the old backstop from the side of the field. Uh, we did that in-house and it, it actually created a very nice clearing over there. The landscaping was, um, there was seed slicing done and there's irrigation that's taking place now. Uh, it looks like the grass is actually starting to come in and that's very promising for right now. What fields was that? I'm sorry. That's on the. The baseball. the baseball softball in the outfield area so it, okay. it is abutting into the that football practice area um, 
we actually did have an extensive conversation of, about the whole football thing that we discussed earlier. Um, they're not using that section with the exception of practicing for kickoffs. And that's only for about 10 to 15 minutes, maybe once, once a week. So there shouldn't be a lot of uh, wear and tear to the field based on the football practices. We did also uh, start looking into uh, removable outfield fencing options. Uh, so that will be not, um, not just like temporary, but we're looking at putting in like permanent, permanent fixture holes so that we can put the fencing in and then remove the fencing as needed. But the, but the, like the ground will stay where you put the fencing. And the tennis courts are, we're still waiting for <laughs> the, the company is still backed up. We have not gotten a firm date from them, um, but we were expecting the end of October. I will find out um, if we can hold true to that. It, it, that may not be possible. Um, that being said, we still anticipate it being done prior to the, to the season. And the last piece that we had hanging out there was the safety laminate on the new vestibules, and that was completed. Okay, why are we considering the removable outfield fencing? That actually, uh, per conversations with yourself and, and other people, the um, interest in the outfield fencing became, became a, a subject of discussion and with the uh, athletics director and the grounds and the uh, director of facilities or the interim director of facilities excuse me scott we were discussing what would be practical there given the use of the field and the seasons and what teams do practice there so we were thinking that the removable fencing we could put the fencing up for the games so that the out the outfield line is clear. However, if there's any kind of practices that need to take place that we can take the, the fencing out, or if we choose to have any type of event in the field back there um, at, some, at some point in time. That was, again, we're simply exploring the option of that. There's nothing has been committed to. I, I'm just going to the fact that we're spending money to level the fields to make it playable to make it safe and now we're talking about putting removable fence panels in that will not be safe even even the kickoff i mean yeah they're running down the field they're kicking the ball they're practicing the kickoffs practicing returns and i, I understand the cramped space but i also understand the need to have a field where the baseball players aren't going to run into a rut and twist an ankle, twist a knee, or something like that. The, the fence would not have, the holes would not be there while the baseball players are practicing. The fences, the fencing would be in the holes and it's sturdy fencing. Okay, so It's just, it's fencing that can be, that can be removed. You put a hole in the ground, you move the fence so you can have football to practice. Football messes up the outfield of the baseball field that we're spending money on to solve now. As I mentioned, the football the football practice is only doing kickoff practice in a small section of that area, so they're really not they're not damaging that area significantly at all right now. Okay, Tim, just to clarify, next. just to clarify though, Tim, that field has been our soccer field. The outfield it's a multi-purpose field, so yes. I think. I think a removable fence, if it's safe, is definitely an option. It's beyond. It's a soccer field. The irrigation was put in to 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 take care of the soccer field, not the baseball field. Yes. Um, marching band has practiced down there when necessary. Um, it, it's used for more than baseball. So I think if the need for a baseball fence is, if we need a baseball fence, then making it removable helps us keep that as a functional field for all the other activities that typically have to use it for, for space reasons. But I would assume something being done like that would be done 
safely to absolutely allow all activities. Yeah. There's inserts. There's inserts, inserts that go yeah. into the ground where the fencing goes, and it doesn't just leave holes in the ground for people. It isn't to, solely a baseball field, out. so it does make sense. And what, if you put a permanent fence up, you're making a, a baseball field. And then we have irrigation in our outfield for what? <laughs> like well, that wasn't the irrigation wasn't put in for baseball. When, when we honestly. discussed this at right. the end of the summer, the concept was to create a specific field. baseball field yes. and a specific yep. softball field. And now we're talking about making it a multi-purpose field again, which defeats the purpose of spending two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars to make all that specific locations. I don't know. I, I would assume it comes down to space yeah. issues, the, right? The, the the repairs that we were engaging in in those conversations was the fencing to make sure that the baseball and softball field had the appropriate fencing and delineation for the kids to play on. And the outfield came into question just with respect to some of the ground being ripped up by the practices. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was not significantly unsafe. There is no leveling that's happening to the, to the field out so there. It is relatively level. We just had the seed slicing done and we're trying to grow the grass back okay. so that any well, of the Forgive me for stepping back and asking and interrupting, but we had sports teams who played other locations because the field was not safe for them to play on. Now you're trying to tell me that it's going to be safe for football to practice on and baseball to practice on and play on. I don't buy it. So the teams asked to be relocated for multiple reasons not just because it was not safe but because the other fields had other amenities that they were looking to utilize while they were playing the games and the damage that was being done in the field was from the football team practicing extensively on that field and that's why we decided to put up a permanent fence in the outfield to keep the football team right. off the outfield that's what I recall as well. That's what I recall as well, to separate the space. Mr. McNulty came, had a map for us, showed all the spacing proposed. Kind of football would have been in what was the old baseball field and like Correct. up to and the bottom of the, the hill rock. near the tennis court side. But that was going to keep baseball, baseball, softball, softball. So was soccer totally displaced, for like permanently for, displaced? I thought it was just yes. this year. Yes, soccer is permanently displaced. Well, no, no. I thought we it was said just we were this year. trying this year, but we would have to seek alternatives. We don't know what those alternatives are. We but we very there. specifically said that the baseball field would be a baseball field. We did. We did. The, the fencing. Or we were, we were, that was what the was direction was and proposed. Yeah. I have, I'll have to go back and review the proposal, but it, it's my recollection. The proposal that we presented with respect to the fencing included the backstop fencing mm -hmm. and the, the baseline fencing. Correct. There was no to make the balls not correct. go out of. But there was the there was no pool. outfield fencing. <coughs> no, okay, correct. that makes sense correct. because I was a little yep. confused by that. But then we talked about temporary fencing which I guess is what you're talking about now. Yes. <laughs> yes. To yes. keep people off that field though, but not to, I don't know, how would you? So, so as I said, the football team asked if they might be allowed to just practice their kickoffs there. And there was a conversation with the interim director of facilities and the football coach and myself. And we determined that based on his explanation of how they would be using the, that small section of the field, and the limited time that they would be using the field, that it wouldn't do any significant damage to the field. So you are correct in the sense that we discussed having the baseball and softball fields be complete fields. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, we still want to make sure that we can use that space as needed if there are other things that we, we choose to do there. And the outfield fencing was never part of the original proposal to, to have permanent fencing. True. So I'm just putting in that um, after conversations, it's clear that some type of fencing will be helpful for the field, regardless of who's using that space at any given time. But for playing baseball and softball, 
the outfield fencing makes a difference for them to know where the boundaries are. So we decided that we would start exploring the options for the for the temporary, not temporary, but uh, removable fencing. Aaron's got a question. So Matt, it, the 275-ish thousand that we approved for, it was for the back, the backstop, backstop dugouts. the dugouts. It did. Based so are you going things. to come to us with a another proposal or are you trying to fit it into that amount we're trying to fit it for the outfield fence existing, yes we're trying to fit it into the existing plans and okay. not have it be a major additional capital expense okay but when we did approve that it was we did not talk about perimeter fencing no okay. correct thank you mm -hmm. Any other questions regarding the facilities? Okay. Oh, we do have a facilities request yeah. as well. Three of them. Yeah, we have a few. In the packet. Four. I can let Tara speak for the first one. Does that get partner? Yeah, we're going to have it here. Um, so the elementary um, school PTO, BME PTO, would, um, is planning a trunk or treat for all of our elementary students. And because we have so many now, we thought instead of either Blackstone or Millville Elementary Schools, either the high school or the middle school would work. I reached out to Mr. Schaefer and Mr. McNulty and found out the schedules. Looks like the high school is most likely being used, so we decided to ask for this building. It'll just be the parking lot um, and all the elementary kids. We're gonna do time slots so families can come um, between like one and two, two or three, three to four and four to five. Um, so to kind of keep the crowd down a little bit, manageable. <laughs> so we would like um, the 23rd as our primary date and a rain date of the 30th. Um, 12 to six so we can have set up and breakdown. But we wouldn't need the building, just the parking lot. Any questions? Okay. You can do them as a packet, okay. unless somebody wants to separate one. But Jane, can I just share that uh, at the very back, you may have noticed. Um, yes, you gave us the rules. Yes, yes, yes. I appreciate that. I did notice. We did list that and the cost of things. Yes, thank you. So any any uh, issues with the town of Blackstone having a fall town meeting? Nope. No. And how about any issues with the dance company? They are asking for the auditorium, cafeteria, um, and the. Teacher's Cafe? Yeah, the yeah. back behind teacher's the cafeteria room. Section. He's always behind, used it. Behind the cafeteria. And those dates, we know there's no sporting activities? Like there's no football game, there's no... I do not. I, I can't confirm that, that nope. schedule. But we don't usually do that. We'll send it over to confer the uh, dates with Linda. So let me... I can tell you that band is over. Band is over. Yeah, but Jill, Jill I mean, approved it. The music room, yeah, she, Jill after, must have checked it with Linda already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one? Mm -hmm. oh. early. That is this is this is Veterans Weekend. Yes, yeah, right. correct. It doesn't look like they'll be there on Veterans Day. Anybody have any issues with or questions about that? It okay. says they want to use our hydraulic lift. Yes, I thought that was weird. Do we have, we let them do that? I'm pretty sure she's used it in the past. Not that it makes it okay to say yes right now, but it's definitely I been used just to hang the lights in the backdrop. Operates it or whatever. There would be custodial. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, she has a custodian. Okay. Checked off on the next page. Yeah. Maybe we get paid for this one. Yeah. <laughs> Not paid, but pay a fee. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve them all. So move. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, so approved.
Thanks, Matt. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, so we're going back. Do we did we do the yeah. warrants? We did warrants. We. Yeah, and I am um, the public forum. Too. Okay. Well, again, I apologize for missing the beginning of the meeting. I apologize for missing what you had to say, but I'll watch it. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it was good. Uh, so we will move on to school committee items. We have a proposal to. Um, engage the um, insurance MIIA Insurance Association to look into their post 65 Medicare program for our uh, current and future retirees. There is a motion in front of you. Um, if somebody would like to make that motion. I'll do it. Okay, thanks Tim. I move that the district engage with the Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Association to participate in their post 65 Medicare program. As such, the district will assume responsibility for paying the associated Medicare penalty fees for current and future retirees. In return, the district will receive a 3% discount on its insurance renewal rate for fiscal year 23. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Amanda. Any discussion? was the representative who talked to us about it at our two meetings ago yes anybody have any questions about it any concerns well i don't think that our concerns at this point can do much because it's either pay a penalty or pay higher rates <laughs> so we're darned if we do and darn double if we don't well, hopefully in the long run we, save we find money. it a savings. Yes. Just in, in terms of our insurance usage, which determines our rates. But in I'm, the short run, we don't know. I, I can add, I know that the question came up at the, that <coughs> initial conversation about how many other people might be in that same category. Correct. Um, and mm -hmm. as of active employees right now that could potentially retire, we have one individual. Oh. Okay that I do not believe intends to need um, to go into this program. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, it was moved by Tim, seconded by Amanda, to engage the Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Association to participate in their post-65 Medicare program as such, the district will assume responsibility for paying the associated Medicare penalty fees for current and future retirees. In return, the district will receive 3% discount on its insurance renewal rate for FY23. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstention? Okay. Uh, so, K H B. Is that this one? Yes. Can yeah. I make one? Uh, you can. Is it all right to just speak to that quickly? Yes, it is. Um, so Amanda and Tammy, uh, Matt, and I have been working on this. As you know, this is the second time we've brought it before the committee, uh, the policy uh, draft. Um, we did get feedback, um, of course, after our packets went out <laughs> for mask. Um, not significant in nature, but just wanted to share very quickly. Um, the uh, our representative from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees, uh, Anne Marie, shared that um, the draft policy is fine um, as it's written. Uh, what she recommended, though, was that we actually leave policy KHB in place and make this policy KHB uh, wow. hyphen R. Yeah. So she was sharing that this would be a good kind of addition to the policy we have, but she does not recommend removing. The other policy so uh, what we would ask uh, is to uh, make a motion to accept it as khbr and then just not do the second motion if that makes sense so you have in front of you um, a policy uh, for sponsorship and advertising uh, we won't read the whole entire policy it has been posted but i'll entertain a motion to approve khbr i so move Okay, Tim, is there a second? Second. 
Sarah. Oh, I'm gonna go with Sarah. <laughs> a little bit quicker. <laughs> um, all right. Is there any discussion? So this is definitely much more detailed. So people should get a very good idea if they want to do something. So we're keeping KHB, which yes. is, is that the last page? Is that the original? That's right. Little tiny paragraph? Yeah. And now it's four pages yep. long? You can advertise. <laughs> this yep. is becoming its friend. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so they don't con contradict each other? No. No. Okay. No. They don't. That I know. Okay. Anybody? Nothing? All right. All those in in favor of approving KHBR as written and submitted, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. There we go. Uh, uh, we also have another um, policy, BEDH which is in a, a draft. Um, and it uh, changes our uh, public comment at school committee meetings. Um, and uh, in, the, in previous iterations of this policy, it just said people would be allowed to speak for an appropriate amount of time and the chairperson would determine appropriate. Um, and the new policy said speakers will be allowed three minutes to present their material. So if somebody wants to come to public forum and, and speak to the school committee, they are limited to three minutes. Uh, we also amended the introduction to say um, however, this is not a question and answer period. The school committee is not able to engage in dialogue during public comment. They are only able to listen. The school committee meetings are meetings in the public and not meetings with the public and not with the public. So, which we have said, which it has been our past practice, which we have said, not always easy to do, but we have said. Um, so does anybody have any questions or discussion? Are we? Doing this, or is this the first reading? The first discussion. Discussion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Discussion. So, any discussion? I are like we? The are idea. we? I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Aaron. Are we putting a wall up in front of us by doing this? Are we? I mean, we we do have to receive the public as well. So, is it a little too open and closed, or are are we? I mean, obviously, we all know sitting here now that we can bring it up in, you know, if someone brings something to us and, and we one of us did want to talk about it, we can bring it up in school committee forum at, later in that meeting. But five years from now, there's four different committee members and, you know, this policy is going to be held over their their table. And... I, I just I feel like it's not very community friendly and so, we are community so it, it is very standard I don't know if it's community friendly or not but it's very standard and it and it is the way that we are trained in our MASC training when we do when we do our initial training um, and it you know it, it, it needs to be consistent and it needs to be fair we can't decide to have conversation with one group because it's a nice friendly conversation and then another group comes in and wants to scream at us and we sit politely and you know follow our rules so i did think we do have to be consistent and i think we do have to have public forum for what it's supposed to be an opportunity to it's not an opportunity for dialogue it's an opportunity for, to present concerns questions congratulations you know whatever whatever somebody wants to make sure they get in front of the school committee so it's a chance to get in front and to to speak your piece if you will but it's not intended to be a dialogue if we want to do that we have open forum meetings we have other opportunities for that um, the, the Tim three, wanted to go and then I'll go to Sarah the, the three minute window and I understand what Aaron's in the bringing up 
but the three minute window gives the speaker an opportunity to prepare their comments, be organized, and get their point across without sitting there rambling for 15 minutes and not completing their thoughts. I like that. Sarah? And um, I think we've talked about it before, but the original intent, I was under the impression that it was um, public forums designed this way so that we can't stifle them. Like they get their three minutes or however many minutes, and even if they're saying things that we want to like jump over the table over, we aren't allowed to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to. Yeah, the only, I, and I don't know, so anything um, the only way we would stop someone is if it were offensive or, you know, and that would out be of, you, completely right? out of yeah, order. That's yeah, further not, yeah, yeah, completely out of Whoever order. Cares. But, but short of that, they have their three minutes to say, What's moving them at the moment? This recommendation came from MASK. Yeah, mm -hmm. very common, very, very, very common. So the however, the yellow section is new. Is new for us. New to us, yeah. but it's standard wording. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I guess the three minutes is quick, but I'm, I mean, town meetings, I think is three minutes too, isn't it? Is. It? Yeah. I think so we've it been like telling three them minutes three is minutes. standards. Yeah, yeah, most of the time we do say, yeah. you have, you know, three minutes. <clears throat> That, you know, my concern is it doesn't let somebody come back again. If if there's a whole group of people and somebody hears something that sparks a doesn't just says three minutes. That's my that's my like. Ooh. Do they but, just come back after someone else? <laughs> I, I, it doesn't. It doesn't. Well, at some point <laughs> too, they if if it's something that they want to have a discussion with us on, they should be entertaining. You know, the chair and asking to be put on the agenda. Right. And then it becomes more of a dialogue. A dialogue. Yep. Anybody else? All right. Well, this will be on our agenda at the next meeting. For approval, we'll make sure it gets posted onto the website. People to review. Uh, and then the next one is... <laughs> Just every time I see it, I want to say like jib jab or whatever. <laughs> What's that Christmas? You know, the oh, that's jib jab. Right? Um, but it's the championship jackets, and we had talked about this. I don't know if we talked about it in our workshop or one of our meetings, but the fact that um, there's no more district or there's no more what? We had received an email from the athletic director. But that there's no um, more district championships. There's now like section, isn't it? Something's different, right? They play almost like a state tournament. But I couldn't now tell what changed in here. But I can't tell what changed in here either. Because it still says district championship. Right. This is just the current, um, if I may. Yes, you okay. may. So this uh, policy JJIBA is our current policy. Nothing changed oh, in nothing. it. Oh, nothing. Okay. Um, one of the our um, members had requested that we bring it up just to discuss because there was a change in the actual bracket structure. Right. Um, so that what we have in our existing policy may not work moving forward uh, based on the bracket structure we have. So the question um, that came up from the policy subcommittee was, do we want, uh, does the school committee, would the school committee like us to take a deeper look at this? <clears throat> Wanted you to have an opportunity to see what the current policy is, and then we could make a draft revisions as we've done with the others um, so that it fits and meets the current um, MIAA structure okay. for central for central mass. So it was more of a information and just to discuss and see if it you know. I, I have a question on number two here, and majority is subjective. That needs to be a hard number, as in a percentage of the season or a percentage of the performances for band. Well, actually, majority is not a hard number. It's just one over a half. 51? I mean, <laughs> right? Majority is just yeah, 50 51 percent plus percent one. over 49, yes. Yeah. So. As a, as a point of information, just because there were questions, I have um, the athletic director's comment that the MIAA is moving to a statewide tournament okay. that so will eliminate structure. the districts. 
and there will be a Central Massachusetts tournament that will occur during the regular season. And I believe the Central Massachusetts tournament will be the equivalent of the district tournament. So I guess the question that, you know, I, I feel it should be explored more. I just worry that if a Central Mass, you know, if, if I'm an athlete in swimming and there's four teams in Central Mass, and so we, you know, we win, versus we're in soccer and we win 20 matches, but we don't win. I don't know. I don't know that it's equitable sport. Like, I don't know what central mass tournament means, like for each sport. So I think we want to make sure they're never going to be equal, but they should be equitable. Um, that we're, if we're awarding a championship jacket and it's not for a state championship, that it should be something that's equitable to a national championship for the band or, you know, not a weekend, you won the weekend tournament kind of thing, or, you know, I, I don't know. And I don't know what the central mass tournament will be. I don't know. So yeah, from my perspective, I'd like to dig into it. Deeper. It okay. sounds like it's a season, like it's going to be their record within their season. Right. Or is it, it's not or something. Or is it a playoff thing? It sounds like. It should be the season champion, like how would be worded. That, that's <laughs> what I think based on the information from the AD, the athletic director. Yeah. <clears throat> we can we can certainly uh -huh. explore this deeper and and look at what recommended changes we could bring forward to the committee for a first read. Okay. Um, but we wanted to just discuss it here. Anybody? First. I'm just have a sense of oh, this? Sorry. Go I was going to go back to Tim's majority. Um, I kind of agree, well, I agree that I think it should even be more than half. It should be like 75 yeah. percent i mean yes. there, it needs to be more than half so but what happens when i mean I guess when COVID. our basketball <laughs> team went up and they they advanced a few years ago and they took two jv players that or that were swingers oh. so what what are we are we hurting those kids right, but they, played, they but were they, part, they practiced with them they did they have the play time or were they playing for their for the jv te team I, I don't I don't think it would be fair to well, that's exclude in, them. That's, in, that's, in that's number addressed one. in number one. Yeah, that's in there. A JV player He's talking about number feels. two, the, 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 what, is, what is majority for a marching band? Uh, so why is there majority on band and not on sports? It does though? say majority, actually, in the beginning. It does say it in both. Yeah. Second but line. it clarifies a JV player. Who's invited to be? Is not counted. Unless the coach and <laughs> another question here is is there a difference between a, a letterman jacket a letterman sweater and a championship jacket is it a special run or do they only get championship jackets we only do jackets we the only titles do as jackets. championship jackets but maybe it's and you know sweaters. i i just i'm a strong believer in school spirit and when something like this happens I think the camaraderie we want to give it to them we're not we shouldn't we're, I, I don't think we should be sitting here saying well let's make sure we understand you know who's actually getting one when that team wins when that when the band wins there's a sense of of camaraderie and excitement and celebration in the community beyond this building the jacket is a small symbol of that but it says it right on the bottom that the they're wearing them with pride and and you're representing your school there's not a lot of kids out there with these jackets i mean i honestly um and and being around the band more than sports we we've been to some schools where when the school that's hosting the band show has all of their alumni there and they're all in letterman jackets you feel their school spirit it's it's a different feeling so i just don't think we should be talking about like how few we we right. could ever give out i would love to see more kids have these I, I at our expense you. too as as a letterman in high school myself i understand that but i i want to make sure that it's not just a participation trophy it is not it, i don't think it ever has been at this school it's been that they've one? been earned 
Oh, I'm not in the band. Okay. But do you have one? Do you play a sport? No. I don't. No. Play okay. a school sport? <laughs> have you think... seen people wear them? Yeah. And yeah. are they very proud of them? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can we Unfortunately, it's been a long time. Can we get feedback yeah. from the coaches and the band director on the policy and see what their thoughts are yeah, on I would, determining? I'd like to see both of them, the, the band director and the athletic coaches, next meeting so that we can get their feedback. Or, I mean, not even necessarily showing up to a meeting, but just getting their feedback on the policy. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think I, mean, I have a couple of questions just based sure. on, like, what would the wording be on the jacket? Because, you know, you feel like uh, districts is pretty succinct. They're district championships. What would we be putting well, on the Central back Mass of this? Champs. Central Massachusetts tournament Champs. champions? In tiny letters, yes. Right. <laughs> is it a tournament, though? That's We don't know. Right. Like, and that's, know. yeah. That's kind of where I feel like it's... Like, I think if you, you know, it says national champion or it says state champion, you get it, but... Right. And, and for the tournaments and things like that, there are patches that you can put on the sleeves to win tournaments or whatever. I, I'm not sure what the basketball team does for tournaments on weekends and holidays, but, you know, that could be put on there as tournament champion oh, yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now, if they go on to win states, do we also give them a jacket? <laughs> Well, so once you have a jacket, that's what you that's get. That's it. Okay. Then you just get patches. Patches. Okay. Patches. So it says that's number five. Any student who has received a jacket will not receive a second jacket. Um, they just gotcha. Uh, I guess they get it lettered, but they do get patches as well. I think. Right. Yes. Patches. Yeah. patches. Is it like a standard jacket for each thing, for like that covers all? championships or is there like a band one or no no or it's a curious. it's a it's it's the same jacket well right? it's the same jacket i mean yeah. whatever the style is of yeah that that you know I, i'm sure it has changed over the however many years but no the band jacket is definitely a corduroy or a right. wool a wool, wool. Yeah. yeah yeah but the football boosters did purchase the the team jacket oh, yes yeah. letterman jackets several years ago and those were different those were the purple body with the leather the, sleeves, the yeah. leather, yeah. yellow sleeves. So I guess I always assumed that our sports jackets would look that way, but yeah. maybe it's something they chose. But those were but those are Letterman, the right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know yeah. the last time we purchased a championship. Unfortunately, <laughs> a, a band. Band. Say that the band. Well, no, no, other than the band. Oh, yeah, no, it's it's I can think it looks oh. Maybe volleyball. <laughs> no, I know. They're, no. they're, they're, what? They're yeah. the game starting <laughs> playoffs <laughs> after. But I'm like lined on the yeah. inside, yeah. so I never had to worry about so the yep. wolves sliding through. But. All right. So we want to explore this more and get feedback from the coaches and the band director. We are on it. Are we okay with that? We are on it. All right. Uh, COVID-19 update, as we had mentioned in our meeting in August, we would review monthly our policy. So we are reviewing for the month of October that the, um, I know Karen has updates for us, but as far as our policy goes, we are sticking with our masks in the school because it's moved to November 1st uh, through Desi and um, we will review it again in November and by then we should have a sense of whether or not they're going to make any changes. There is an option for schools to um, make changes to the mask policy. If those impacted are over 80% in our communities, they are not. So we are not eligible for that exemption. But Karen, what would you like to add to add that, if anything? Um, no, we're, we're not at those vaccination rates yet. Um, hot off the presses from today, Blackstone 12 to 15 year olds is at 46%, 16 to 19 is at 54. The town as a whole is also at 54%. For Millville, 12 to 15 is 37%. 16 to 19 is 57 and Millville as a town is 44 percent. Wow. So we have a long way to go for to get to 80. any of our schools to hit 80. Yeah. 
Um, and I, you know, I completely understand that that it is personal choice, but that personal choice is truly impacting many, many individuals. And we get emails. I, sometimes it feels like daily. I know it's not, but um, you know, I know that I know that we've opened up so much more that there are more community events and family events, but we have to be better. We have to do better. Yep. And our cases this year, um, we hit 34 cases today. We last year we hit 34 cases in January. Yep. So, so it's new. you know Karen, last hope, year at this time we were at we were at two two right yeah. Yeah, two, two or three yeah. two yep we had no cases in September we had one case on October seventh and one case on October tenth so and so far we have thirty four. I was in a corn maze when you and I were talking on that and day. Did you have the, the vaccination <laughs> clinic or get one set up for the students? Yeah, um, I was going to get to that for okay, in a sorry. minute, but I can can jump to that. So there is a an employee flu clinic that is scheduled for October twenty first. The um, student flu clinic for the middle school and high school will be. November 3rd and 5th tentatively and I'm waiting to hear back from the state on the COVID clinic. So as soon as I know more I will share that with you. Um, as far as other numbers so far we've had 290 in-school close contacts 48 of those did test and stay. 206 were monitoring only, meaning they were in the three to six feet range and masked. Um, 10 were vaccinated. 23 opted to quarantine rather than test and stay. And three had previously been positive in the last 90 days. So far, we've done over 180 tests um, with our test and stay and overall close to 200 of the antigen tests. Have there been any positive cases from our close contacts? No. No. There, well, there was one that was a non-quarantining close contact that tested positive but it's hard to say in that case whether the exposure came from the student or elsewhere Other questions for Karen? anything else i just want to add um, i did see on the news this week that the first school was um, approved to remove masks. I think it was Holliston. Did you hear Hopkins Day? Hopkins Day, nice to approve, uh, corrected. So it is possible that they, they met the 80% and got the approval from DESE, mm -hmm. I believe, so. It's 80% in that building? 80% of that age group for yeah. that building. Yeah. So, so if it were the high school, it would be the 16, well, no, it would have to be the 12. It would have to be both groups. Right. It would have to be both groups. Yeah, the, the way DESE breaks down the numbers don't correlate Match, yeah. with the schools. But it's 80% of the building. But of, of the building, yes. yeah. All, all staff and students in that building. So do we actually have that number? You're giving us town, mm. town numbers, but no. where do we stand? How do we get that information? It's hard to get... Um, our Aspen doesn't connect with the state um, immunization system. Plus we have some, um, both staff and students that are getting vaccinated in Rhode Island. So 
those numbers aren't shared with us unless the family or the you know staff member shares them. So we're actually not even sure where we stand. Even be, we can't really no. go from the Blackstone and Millville numbers. No. So. I would, well, I, well, I would, I would disagree with we, that. I, I would disagree. That we can't accurate. be higher than it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. We can be. We can. Well, we could be if they got vaccinated in Rhode Island. And I, I can say that all my kids did. So yeah. I don't understand. I don't, I don't know. Like, what are we doing to see where we actually stand in the high school? Because if 80% of the staff and students in that building. We're not even close, Aaron, respectfully. We're not. I can tell you right now we're not. Look at, look at, if you look at the numbers, and, and I would also add, Karen, the older teen numbers, the, uh, what is the bracket is 16, it's 16, 16 to, 19. to 19. So how so, many of the yeah. 18 and 19 year olds that are in that bucket, which is just around 50%, is that right? Um, 50, yeah, 54, 54 and 57. And then, yeah. Right, yeah. are getting those for college. They're not even students that are here. So I, I, I'm, I'm saying what I think what Jane is saying, which is we would have to have over 30% of our students that got vaccinated in Rhode Island that haven't reported that. I don't know. I, I think I, if people want us, if the if people in the high school certainly. staff students want the masks go, to go away, we need to find a way to get that vaccination information yep. loaded somehow. Yep. Yeah, the cha the only challenge we'll have with some type of a general survey is anybody can say yes. Yeah, no, you can't. Some way of you have to show the card. As yeah, they say, you have, have to show evidence, the so. card. Yeah. yeah. Are other districts doing that? Yeah. How did Hopkins do? Yeah, I wonder what they did. Too. <laughs> Well, it's a city, so they probably just went on their city data. And also, a lot of schools have other health um, reporting systems where you can access the MIIS information, and Aspen doesn't allow you to do that. So for us to get any information from there, we have to go into each you have to search each individual student, which is very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. That said, we'll do what we need to do to make sure that we yeah. have the accurate information. Now. It just stands to, it, it, it's yeah. a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard piece to think that we have 80% of our kids, yeah. students at the high school vaccinated yeah, when our not adult. not there yet, but. Yeah, yeah. but no. we will be, we hope, we right, there, at some point. Just yeah. need to know how to get that. Yeah, eventually. Because right? <laughs> I, I have a feeling that it would balance out. Like the numbers that did go to Rhode Island would balance out with kids that are either in college or at right. a different school. Right, right, right. Yeah, I don't, I don't foresee that we would, our actual school would be higher. I, I truly don't. Yeah. And in talking with people in other districts, they're finding their numbers lower than what the state is reporting. Mm. I haven't heard of anyone finding that they have more kids than than what the state has said are vaccinated. Okay. Anything else for Karen? Thank you for what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. For you. Your uh, Sarah. Capital planning update. We met yesterday, last night. Um, it was a, that was a lot of information. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of good information. Um, so, so far we've assessed future program needs, like educational program, identifying building and capital needs, and then thinking through possible grade configurations. Another update was that we've commissioned a demographer to look at our population and enrollment trends because that's going to make a big difference in determining where we go from here. Um, and we're going to be getting that information next, probably next week, right? Okay. So that'll be good to go through. Um, last night we actually started fitting the different uh, grade configurations into what we have. So into our current buildings, we stripped away like what condition the buildings are in that was separate and looked at like our numbers as they are now at the different grade levels and how they could fit into our existing structures. Um, 
that would, and we, what the, looking at my notes, how they could possibly fit into existing buildings to best meet the needs of the various grade level students. Um, we also clarified that the maintenance and general repair work is not actually a part, not going to be a part of this subcommittee. We're looking at and focusing on larger configuration and building needs. That's, that work isn't taking place, but the focus right now is on this larger capital plan project. Um, anything else? I think you put all the bases. Yeah. The, um, talk about a little bit about the future, like that committee's plan to get this information out to the oh, towns and the yeah. public. Yes. Okay, so we have another meeting on October 27th, 530 Hartnett Middle School here. Um, November 10th, we're going to have, what are we calling it? An open forum? Yeah, well, the November 10th is your point your meeting. It's an informational session yes. or like an info session to share our progress for so far um, and just give an update on our work. And that's at 6.30. 6 Thank you. I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was a good meeting and good attendance. Yeah. Yeah, we have some new people. Mm -hmm. the, so the, the committee itself is meeting on that November 10th from 5.30 to 6.30. And then at 6.30, we've invited town officials, administration, and uh, school, committee areas, school committee and board members, town board members, to um, engage in just a presentation of where things stand right now. And then from that meeting, we are inviting the public, correct, to a public forum? Yes. Yes. That is the intent. The, the intention is to invite the public to a public forum at the following school committee. Yeah. November 18th. November 18th. That would be when we actually have Sorry, I an idea of what we want to do to present our, our well, plan. Well, hopefully it will be presented to the on a joint channel. info session yeah. and then people will have a chance to review it to come to a public forum to give us some yes. feedback. Yep. Good. So hopefully that won't be the first time people see something. Yep. And to, to be clear, mm -hmm. this process is not to approve anything. Nope. It's just to understand what we're considering submitting for consideration. Right. Yep. <laughs> Understand the need. It's very yeah. yeah. Just to understand the need exactly. If we, if and we it gotten, sounds great and ridiculous, but it's actually that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have, have we gotten the PowerPoint presentation so that we can distribute it? Uh, I, they aren't at that point yet. No, not yet. No, we haven't. But I will check in with Greg. They were That's revising nice the PowerPoint presentation because yeah, there were some of the numbers right. that we had yeah. asked to. Well, and, uh, and, and I, that, I don't think we should share that. that will be, no, that That's will be significantly good. narrowed down after the yes. October yep. 28th, 7th? I believe Tim was asking <laughs> about the people were, that yeah, were at the meeting. He, I believe yeah. he meant yeah. from the share sure. committee yes. members. Oh, 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 oh. oh. No, it's going to be fixed. Yeah, it needs to be fixed, and then it'll we be can't shared with the subcommittee. Right. Right. And, and, and fix it, and then it's going to add that other breakdown. <laughs> Correct. There was one great. There was a great configuration that wasn't test fit. Yeah. Yep. So they're going to add that and then share it with the yeah. subcommittee. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, the MASC MASS. Um, joint conference that usually happens in November is you should have all are you all getting MASC mail yes your homes and you are not I, I'm getting spammed with it yes <laughs> you have never Carrie nope I get a daily email from them like oh, the, I don't get well, I don't I don't that. if you're getting that I'm surprised you're not getting I'm the other surprised stuff. you're not getting um, you might want to have Catherine mm -hmm. double check that you're actually registered I'm as a that now. member and are you getting Amanda? Mm -hmm. Okay. So does anybody have interest in going to the conference? If so, you should send a note to Catherine. Um, and I believe you have an option of going in person or virtually. So I do believe there are virtual sessions. People are interested. 
but I wanted to. It's cheaper if you do it sooner. So if you are, I know, and Tammy's not usually here, but she usually tries to go, which was what reminded me to put it on the agenda to see. But Tammy, if you're watching, mm -hmm. let us know if you want to go. Okay, and that is all that's on our section. So we'll turn it over to Dr. DeFalco. Great, thanks. Good evening, everybody. An hour and 15 minutes in. Mm -hmm. Usually I'm saying that a lot sooner. I think that is great. Uh, it's nice to see everyone this evening. And um, we have a few items on my report uh, tonight, and we are going to start by talking a little bit about our spring 21 MCAS data. Um, and before we uh, do a walkthrough of our performance, I want to talk a little bit about um, the purpose of the test last year, uh, just to kind of recalibrate all of our thinking. Um, I know the results have been public for a few weeks, so it well, won't be new to probably many people. Um, but uh, I do want to make sure to re-anchor the purpose in our conversation because um, last year the assessment as the commissioner framed when he put it out to schools across the Commonwealth was really for instructional purposes only. Um, and so basically what that's referring to is making sure that, like we would do any year, that teachers and principals are able to use that information to help inform and kind of plan where they're going to go next with our teaching and learning. Um, but there were some differences in last year's tests, just uh, to remind everyone about that. Uh, but before we go into that, I, I would like to share that our students, um, we had a really strong participation. Uh, which I think is a testament to our parents and our students um, that really understand the seriousness of this uh, because even remote families took it uh, and most came in. So um, I just, you know, I, I want to really give the kudos for that. We had over 95% participation, um, which is really great. Uh, so that means, you know, if our students enrolled over 95% that needed to take it, took it. In most cases, we were up as high as 99%. Um, so a big shout out to our families and our students for that. Um, you know, I know that this can be a hot button issue on a good year, never mind in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but I think everybody stepped up and, and really uh, and showed up to do what they needed to do. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, so with that being said, um, we took time, if you recall, the school committee approved, which we're really grateful for, an additional day to work with our staff before the students arrived this year. Um, and at the time, the data we had was just preliminary. It was embargoed. We really couldn't talk about it or do much outside of the four walls of the classroom, so to speak, uh, with that information. But we, we used it to help us uh, do really two things. One, square what we thought we knew based on the end of last year's uh, STAR data and all of our assessments and general classroom testing um, and student work projects and all the end of year work. Um, because if you recall, we took all that work and we did a lot of planning over the summer with it. And specifically around which students, at least at the time, seemed would need additional supports around math, English, science. We use that, if you recall, for planning uh, with additional interventionists, uh, but also for additional social, emotional learning and behavioral supports. Because we have a lot of data and information on that too. So we were able to fold a lot of that work into this as well. Um, and then with the preliminary data in that extra planning day, we were able to really square our thinking with, okay, here's what we thought, this is what we planned for. Now, what is this telling us? Or do, we, do we have the right students in these groups? Are we starting off on the right track? Um, and I will say that once the data became public and we actually had all of the information back, our principals, coaches, teachers went through that process again. Um, the reason I'm mentioning that is because uh, when we received the results, um, you know, nobody was thrilled with the outcomes, of course, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, in most cases, although we did have some highlights for sure. Um, but we were already, you know, a month into our work. Uh, so um, our mantra, as you know, throughout all of this has been, we're not going to panic, we're just going to be prepared. Uh, we've stuck to that. And when we got the results in September, the final results were we actually able to look at questions and standards a much deeper level than we could do even in the uh, late August days of our planning. We really were able to just crosswalk and make sure that what we had was working. So um, 
again, from that perspective, our principals, coaches, our teachers, teacher support staff, everybody has worked really hard to try to get this right. Um, and so um, as we walk through the data this evening, I do not want people to feel discouraged. In some cases, it might be hard, uh, but there are some good headlines that I think we need to be focusing on as we, as we talk about um, our data. Um, and just the last piece I wanted to reference is um, to anybody who's watching at home and thinking about some terms or some words that we hear a lot uh, lately, like acceleration or RTI, response to intervention, um, that really is a direct result of the data we're going to look at and the gaps that were created from um, our you know, teaching and learning models last year, which we had to do as a result of the pandemic. And again, we were a school system, we were six from the top with the most in-person instruction. So um, keep that in mind, yep. that if we didn't have that, I cannot Imagine, fathom yeah. where the results um, would be with that. Um, so I just wanted to do a little bit of framing as we um, take a few minutes and walk through our data. Um, and I'm not gonna delve too deeply into this, but it's always important to look at the who. These are our demographics, um, our most recent demographics. And you can see to the left, um, our selected student populations, um, economically disadvantaged, high needs, um, ELL students. It's important to remember that your economically, that our economically disadvantaged percent is not the same as the free and reduced lunch numbers. Um, the economically disadvantaged percent are those families that um, are at that free and reduced lunch um, level that are uh, enrolled for some level of support or service. So um, you've heard recently we've shared that our um, free reduced lunch numbers are over 50% as a district. Mm -hmm. You're noticing that our economically disadvantaged numbers are much lower. Um, these are the percentage of families that are enrolled in some level of support from the state, if but, that makes sense. What's the difference between first language, not English, and an English language learner? Wouldn't somebody whose first language not be English be an English language learner or not necessarily? They might have already got out of that. Yeah, there, so there's, a, there's, a, there's the, this acronym called FLEP, Formally language, huh. yeah. So it's that's a formal that, that ELL person. student. <laughs> so that's the, the first one's the flip or whatever. The first one are our students that, uh, yes, that, that includes your FLEP students. I know it's a terrible acronym, yeah. but yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> right. So that gives you the whole umbrella. Mm -hmm. And then of course the table to the right is our, um, our racial and ethnic diversity uh, numbers. Uh, the bottom are just some important data points to share. Four year graduation rate uh, is at 96.8%. Our dropout rate uh, is 0.7. Um, our daily attendance rate, again, was is over 95%. However, when you look at the 10, you're, you're probably gonna, I'm sure you're processing this. Right there. Yeah, yeah. The, the missing 10 days or missing 10%. So the daily attendance rate is just what it means. It means the number of kids that are showing up every day. But when you're looking at the missed 10%, those students are also the ones that are missing the daily. So you can see that we have a chronic absentee issue with a very small percentage of our population that are not coming on a daily basis. Does that make sense? Those numbers are a little... Yeah squirrely when you and look that at that is with how those compare to other districts are missed or chronic absenteeism like so there's not a state um like you'll see when we look at the performance data there's state averages on everything there's yeah. not a state average on that um, but what we are able to do is drill down into those numbers we actually know who those students are mm -hmm. um, and our principals our social worker and our school uh, clinical teams like our guidance counselors adjustment counselors we knew these students, frankly, last year, and we're already doing work with those students. Um, so we can drill into it. We can look at it student by student. We look at subgroups um, to really start doing some targeted work, which, which frankly, we've already started. But this is with excused or without excused? The state does not recognize excused, but we do, correct? These are, these are unexcused absences. So that doesn't even include excused. excused. These are unexcused absences. <clears throat> and this is, you know, a number that we've been talking about for a couple of years. Um, right. That being said, 
but it's but you know the people missing ten, I mean that's five percent of your school that's that's significant and it's a lot um, the daily attendance rate is again you know we and I, I really dislike drawing parallels to other places or to large aggregate numbers because, frankly, I don't usually care. I care about the four walls of our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think in this circumstance it's important only because uh, through last year, I'm sure you read a lot of the same headlines and heard a lot of the same news stories that I did, students and families just went missing. Um, we had a very tight rein on where our students were yeah. and did a lot of follow-up and follow-through. So I just want to put that out there because, again, our, our clinical and student support team see these numbers and they're wicked discouraged. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want them to be because mm -hmm. they've done a ton of follow-up and follow-through mm -hmm. with our families. But I did want to make sure that we just highlighted that before uh, we do uh, kind of a walkthrough of our data. So normally, as you know, we don't even frankly look at this data I don't I never uh, in the, at least the past few years have I put up uh, state district comparison information because it's just not important I like to look at how we do compared to us not how we do compared to others because I can't and, and our staff can and none of us can control what other people do right so um, but I do think it's important this year only because of the year we've just had mm -hmm. um, and I did not break it down into a significant number of tables like we're going to look at in a moment when we're looking at how we did against ourselves. Um, but the color coding does give you in the bar graphs, do you just a really quick kind mm -hmm. of glance at how we did compared to the state. Um, and so to the left, you can see on the first uh, bar graph is uh, English language arts, grades three through eight combined. Those are all students. So there's all the subgroups and everybody's in that. See our aggregates, everyone. The left uh, bars are the school district and the right is the state. What I appreciate about the visual is that it does give you a quick um, kind of side-by-side -side comparison of how we did. Um, and, and all of this data, by the way, is public. It's on our school district profile page. Um, and if there is anyone tuning in that wants to delve deeper into this, I'm like a wicked data guy. So I'm happy to share any additional information, any follow-up that anybody would be interested in uh, looking at. Um, but this does give a, a very quick kind of at a glance look to see how we did uh, as an aggregate grades three through eight in English language arts, mathematics and science and science. Remember, it's just grades five and eight here. Our data we will break down in subsequent slides, but this just gives you a quick side by side. Um, so uh, this is where we get into um, our district data and um, on slides four through nine is where we are looking at, this is slide four, where we're looking at our 2019 and 2021 achievement and growth data. So um, before we walk through this, just some quick headlines um, and note that even though we're looking here at 2019 and 2021 data, the tests were still different in that um, the 2019 uh, MCAS had three sessions of English and math. The 2021 um, had two sessions. So just important to note that the students had less problems. So on one hand, you might think, well, well we should have done better. On the other hand, it makes each one of those questions more high stakes because they have less of a sample to pull from. Um, so I just wanted to make sure to highlight that because uh, that's an important piece. But with that being said, there are some good news stories here to share. Um, one of the first pieces you'll probably notice is that in our grade three English language arts, uh, we saw an increase of students that are meeting or exceeding grade level expectations. And that's a significant increase. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really pleased to see, and remember grade three was here every day. So that's just an important mm -hmm. piece <laughs> to put out mm -hmm. there. And they also had our first year with our new reading program. Now, programs don't teach. We know that. Mm -hmm. Teachers teach. But I will tell you that the, the teachers are using the materials. And they're going through all the training and the coaching and the support around that. Uh, so we saw a really nice increase there. You also will notice that in grade four English language arts, um, we saw a nice, a very nice increase in the percentage of students meeting or exceeding expectations. 
So something to keep in mind, our current, so that these students, these fourth graders um, were, are now our fifth graders, right? And they were third graders when the pandemic started. So that, so that, that tail end of their third grade year, they were full remote. Um, and I just share that because that's some pretty significant growth to share or to see in, in, in a year like we had last year. There is no growth for fourth grade. There usually is, but you won't have any growth because those students did not take the third grade test, right? That was the 2020 data. Um, so as far as some, and we'll, walk, we'll continue to walk through in a moment, but as far as some general headlines, we saw some nice increases, as I mentioned, in grade three and four English language arts. We actually saw a nice increase in grade 10 in the percentage of students exceeding expectations. English language arts in grades five, seven, and eight were basically flat. And you'll see you're up or down a few points um, in either one of the performance categories. Um, grade six was an anomaly. Grade six saw a significant decrease in students at grade level expectations. Those are the current seventh graders. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, mathematics across the board were struggling. Um, now, I think an interesting piece, and you might recall, we talked about this last spring when we looked at our STAR data. We noticed at the time that our ELA scores were much stronger than our math scores. And we had a conversation um, around the notion that like, it, it, it sort of made sense because reading is something kids will tend to do more on their own than sit at home and do math practice, right? Kids are more likely to pick up a book, a magazine, a newspaper, um, you know, something as opposed to sit and practice math problems. Um, so on one hand, um, it almost made more sense that we saw more growth in ELA uh, than we would see in math. Um, then on slide five, this breaks down fifth grade. Again, you can see no significant changes in fifth grade in ELA and math. We did see, a, we did unfortunately see the gains that we were making in science take a step back. And where I think our teachers did a really, really good job of trying to do virtual labs, it's really not the same as it is having a beaker and all the equipment and materials you need in your hands. Um, but you can see that we did take a step back in, in science. Uh, middle school data, as I mentioned, sixth grade uh, really struggled uh, from a performance standpoint. Um, this is very, and I will say kind of twofold, this is very rare for sixth grade period. We've never seen data like this in grade six at least since I've been here, I can only speak to my four years. Um, but we also haven't, we didn't see data like this across the district. So there was an anomaly here. Um, and the um, middle school principal coach and myself, we've actually had conversations with the sixth grade team. I've only spoken to a couple of the teachers. Um, but I know that sixth grade was a really difficult transition year. In general, the students are moving to middle school. Um, and I think there was some concern around wanting to make sure they spent a significant amount of time reteaching the fifth grade material that the students did not get because they were fully remote from March, April, May, and June in fifth grade. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about we can't live in the place of remediation, we have to be thinking about acceleration. That's a great example of why. This is a great example of we need to start the school year, which all of our grade levels have done, right on grade level material, do some of those just-in-time interventions and that reteaching for students that we need and have really strong response to intervention groups, which we're doing with our interventionists and our classroom teachers. So I just, you know, I know when you see the data, it's somewhat startling to look at uh, because it is, um, but there is a why behind that that we're aware of and that is being addressed. Uh, what's interesting, hot off the press, uh, is the, yeah. the STAR beginning of year data we just got, uh, I just got today. Uh, seventh grade is struggling still, even in comparison, but it does not look anything like this, which is really good news. So those interventions that we've been doing the past five, six weeks, they're seeming to be taking some hold anyhow. And we have a long way to go. But. 
our grade eight data. These are our current freshmen. And again, you can see basically flat. What I think is really fascinating about the, the grade levels that are flat, their data is flat with a year of pandemic instruction. And so what I, you know, what I, what I keep saying to the principals and coaches uh, and to the teachers when I, can, when I can meet with them is, you know, feel confident. We got this data, which is not great, but during a year and almost a half of living through a pandemic and having fully remote, hybrid, reshifting the model in the spring, bringing the kids back, but keeping remote kids. We, we did this in an environment that was, was, uh, was very challenging. So I hope that kind of makes sense mm -hmm. in terms of like looking where we'll be. Uh, similarly, like I, we did with grades three through eight, this is just grade 10, ELA and math. Um, and again, this gives you a very quick side-by-side -side in how we did to the state. Uh, if anyone wants to delve into the numbers, again, I'm happy to share any of those specifics, but just so we don't have, you know, 15, uh, well, you know, 100 slides in, in data tables, we did a quick snapshot. Appreciate it. Um, but again, slide nine, you can see the side by side for grade 10 in 2019 and in 2021. 2019, I want to remind everybody, that's when the state changed the exam MCAS. to the MCAS yeah. 2.0. Remember when we calibrated the 2019 results under the old MCAS, the legacy, we were at 99% proficient and advanced. Under the new regs, you can see that changed very quickly to 56%, <laughs> meeting and exceeding, which is okay, right? We're fine with moving the goalposts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a, a good news story here is we did have almost 10% more students in that exceeding category. Um, yeah. So the overall meeting and exceeding number didn't shift significantly, but we were able to move that, those top tier students into that next bracket as far as performance goes. And again, math, our meeting and exceeding numbers were flat, um, but the not meeting did increase. So we've got a lot of work to do in math. And I know the committee is aware of all the work we're yeah. doing, particularly on curriculum. Yeah. Special education, again, side by side, this is the district to the state. I did break the numbers down on the next slide, which I'll skip to because it's just easier to look at. Yeah, but so there's Please. nobody, and I know it comes up in the next slide because yep. I checked it myself, but it's just so everybody's clear, there's nobody in these categories exceeding. Correct. Yep. And there it is. There it is. So if you look at our 2019 to 2021, grades uh, 2021, excuse me, grades three through eight, these are students with special needs only students with special needs only. Um, you can see the when you pull the collective grades three through eight together, you'll see the first column is 2019, the second is 2021, and then we did include the state averages to give everybody a general sense of what that breakdown is. So you can see, when I look at this data, uh, to me, my we have a crisis happening across our state as far as I'm concerned with students with special needs. And, and not that we can manage that, we can only control what happens here, and we have a lot of work to do here. We, have a um, here too. we do. Yeah. We have a lot of work to do here. Um, and I know uh, from multiple conversations with Ms. PG, with the principals, with the coaches, two big focus areas for students that we're trying to really raise that uh, floor with are students with special needs and are economically disadvantaged. Both of those subgroups struggled significantly. Um, they struggle on a given year you can see clearly how much the pandemic has impacted their learning. Um, we don't have the economically disadvantaged performance here, but if you were to see that, you would see those students are struggling almost to the levels where our students with special needs. And what is the headline, at least I keep hearing and reading about, and I'm sure all of you are seeing the same things, is that the pandemic has impacted those, particularly families living in poverty, more so than anybody else. Um, well, we're seeing a direct result in our uh, achievement in our growth here as well. The good news, we know that. The good news, we've been planning for it, and we've, or we're, we've been off and running since the first day of school. Actually, before, because you did you your know, acceleration. The summer, work. summer work. And then this is our uh, science, I'm sorry, grade, uh, grade 10, my apologies, science. Students uh, with special needs, same thing. So you can see grade 10 ELA, math, in the side by side there. The only thing to keep in mind with these numbers, these are very small, small numbers people. of students, okay. yeah. 
Not small people, small number. Right. I said small people, you didn't. And so really the, the, the so what now what is probably the best segue into our into my goals for this year or our district goals. Um, because as you know, we've done a lot of work preparing for this. We've done a lot of summer work with over four, uh, over 500 students in summer programming, additional instructional coaches in our buildings, teams of interventionists at every building level, additional STEM courses and an increase in science, and an increase in after school programming uh, for students. And so before I jump into this, I just want to take a moment and I would like to thank Aaron and Tim, uh, who spent a significant amount of time uh, meeting with me and discussing, and you know, discussing the goals, but I would also pose discussing uh, more than that, because our goals are really should be a reflection of our data and a reflection of where we need to go. Um, and so I, as they are on the superintendent evaluation subcommittee, um, we were able to spend quite a bit of time together talking a little bit about where we need to go um, and where our focus areas should be. So a big thank you to both of them for their hard work and removing my clip art on my slides. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos. You'll notice it's almost gone. <laughs> um, so as always, our district improvement strategy until uh, we continue to develop that next iteration of our blueprint, which we're working on, um, remains the anchor of the work that we are doing. In our goals this year, um, we will see that there is a, I hope, an evident focus on two areas, uh, which is community and equity. And I want to explain the why behind that. Um, the focus has always been, and it's part of our improvement strategy, bringing the communities together around the schools and really being a district of, of one. Um, I don't think I'm saying anything that others probably aren't thinking because we've already all said this, but you know, we went into this situation together, we've got to come out of it together. Mm -hmm. And so we need community more now than ever. And so uh, for, again, those that are tuning in, um, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for the work and support that we've done to date, but it really is time to roll up our sleeves, to increase uh, that level of support, communication, civility, and let's keep pushing forward. Uh, because the other thread to this is equity meaning we need to give everybody what they need. Uh, and what they need looks and sounds and feels different mm -hmm. from one student to the next, one teacher to the next, one family to the next. So while we're talking about this acceleration of academics and social emotional learning, because that is a hugely important part of this work, um, we can't do it without the threat of community inequity. And so I hope that the school committee and those that are tuning in at home see that we're trying very hard to pull both of those levers um, in order to, to do what we need to do to move our district forward and get out of the situation we're in that was caused from the pandemic. Um, so with that, um, we, as we have in the past couple of years, are trying to get really focused on just a few things uh, and become good at those few things. And so underneath the superintendent evaluation uh, standards, um, once we determined uh, as a subcommittee where the focus areas should be uh, of actual work, we then talked about, okay, well, with all of that being said, where should these indicators be and which one should, which one should we be focusing on? Um, and so as we go through this uh, school year, the school committee will see the work and the evidence of the work being done anchored back underneath instructional leadership to these two indicators, management and operation under those two indicators, et cetera. Um, so again, you know, that, that's a lot of conversation and a lot of work mm -hmm. and a lot of pushing uh, from Aaron and Tim to really think about where should our focus be as we continue to, to uh, move our system forward. And so these are the eight indicators that we picked. So now into the kind of the meaty part of it. Um, our first professional, or my professional practice goal, which is part of our, uh, the development of our next strategic plan. And so um, 
I don't want to read the goals to you, but on slide five, <laughs> you will see uh, the focus is to create at the end of the school year through a significant stakeholder involvement, um, a new district strategy. Um, and we say new, but my sense is at least after the first uh, few weeks of delving into this work in one of our workshops, it'll be a probably a much deeper and more focused version of our uh, current blueprint. But there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. I think one of the highlights here is that um, this really needs to be driven by our students, families, staff, leadership, governance, and community. Uh, and I wanna make sure that the community knows this is not something that I sit and write and give to the school committee. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that actually is very much grassroots and from the ground up. Um, that's how we did the first one. And uh, that's how we plan on and how we've already started doing our next version. The second uh, goal is our district improvement goal. And the focus here is on academic acceleration. Um, and I do just wanna kind of touch on a few important pieces here. Uh, because while this is a curriculum and instruction goal, uh, curriculum being specifically around uh, mathematics, um, and the instruction being really around strengthening our classroom teaching and learning, and strengthening the, um, the response to intervention model, I think it's critically important to mention that the work that is running parallel to this is also around our social emotional and behavioral uh, supports. I can say to you that uh, Jill, Matt, and I have already had our first focus groups with students in every building. Um, MES, the complex, the middle school, and the high school. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to hear. Uh, we did this last week. They all use different language, of course, right? Our students at MES, our, our youngest learners, you know, talked about, um, you know, people are mean or people are nice, right? They kind of use very basic language. Someone may have mentioned a unicorn, actually, um, <laughs> get her back on track. Um, but, you know, listening to our five and six year olds, they were really, you know, they were really honest about what they like about school, what's working so far, what's not. One of the things we heard uh, from our youngest learners is that they love the opportunity to learn about each other. And when we asked them why did they, they all said, we love our teacher, we love our teacher. And we asked why, why do you love your teacher? because they, all of them is said in different ways, but because they give us a chance to learn about one another. And we get to share about ourselves, which I thought was really powerful, right? When you think about what the little, right? Your, your little learners want to be able right. to do. They wanna mm -hmm. learn about themselves. They wanna learn about each other, right? They're five and six years old. Um, so that was really, uh, really important to hear. Um, at the complex, uh, we started to hear a little bit of a different story. So that was really interesting. Um, one theme that ran through the complex middle and the high school is that the pandemic has really changed the way students feel about each other. Yeah. Uh, they said it different, but uh, we heard uh, comments at the complex like, you know, we don't really understand when we all left, things seemed to be fine. When we returned, the kids seemed to not like me anymore, or the kids seemed to be really angry towards me or it was really fascinating. The middle and high school students were much more clear. You know, they're like, well, they, you know, we've been behind a keyboard for a year. And now that we're out from behind that, we have to face each other again. And we said some things we probably shouldn't have said, mm -hmm. right? And we think about all the things that we've been through as a, as a team, a governance leadership team. And I think we would probably say, <laughs> we've experienced some of that too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, there's some resetting that needs to be done. And Sarah, you pushed this issue a lot at the last meeting. I'm glad you did because we need to focus uh, very much on that. Uh, and I know it was really important to Aaron and Tim when we took the feedback from the workshop to think about, you know, how do we embed that work in what, in what we're doing? Uh, because we really are, and, and uh, it, it's so important. It's one thing to have students achieving and growing but it's another thing if you look at our purpose you yeah, know they'll be happy healthy you want really happy healthy kids as students at the end of the day mm -hmm. so um that data when you hear about data cycles and you look at that last bullet point that includes data like what i just shared it's not just the you know the the, the black and white numbers right 
uh, which leads us to goal seven around equity, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, one of the things our, our chair of our school committee did not mention, for those of you who might be interested in going to the mask mass meeting, there will be a uh, fabulous panel at the, fabulous. End, <laughs> at the end of the first day, which Jane and I will be on, uh, to talk a little bit about the DEI work um, and to be able to share some of our lessons learned, which I know we're really excited to do. Um, but this remains a focus of ours across the school district, as you know, um, and looking specifically at these six areas, five areas, sorry, I did that the last time, these five focus areas, um, strengthening core instruction, creating safe spaces in our schools, selecting curriculum and materials, particularly, for instance, um, around mathematics, right? We're in that process this year. We heard from our students that they want materials. We, it's like the, the, uh, the windows and mirrors piece, right? They want materials that represent students so. that look and sound and feel like them, but they also want students who don't. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important. So when we're looking at selecting a new math program, we wanna make sure that we're getting the right materials in the hands of our, of our students. And so that will very much be part of that. Honoring diversity of thought, but understanding and recognizing there's a tension between awareness and judgment in this work. And then empowering our students to and owning and valuing and sharing their personal stories. And again, I th just this goes back to <clears throat> the work we heard from our student reps earlier. You know, we're hosting the first uh, of our of our uh, of our kind. You know, uh, yeah, solidarity yep. conference at our high school yep. for Blackstone Valley high schools, which is inc this is the inaugural great, one, yep. and we're hosting it. Yeah. So just so impressed and continue to be impressed by our students at the high school, the work they're trying to move there. Um, and it's about empowerment and helping students own their story and there's power in that story. Um, so we're really excited about that and supporting, uh, supporting that work. Um, our capital planning focus. This is, again, should be no surprise, Sarah just gave a great update tonight on the work that's been going on for quite some time in that area that I know, Matt, you've been partnering side by side uh, with Sarah as well and helping get us to kind of where we are with the Capital Planning Committee. There's been a ton of work that's gone into that. Um, and so the idea at the end of this year is that we will have submitted a statement of interest, we, we hope, right, by, uh, I think, January sometime, and that we'll have some of our small uh, capital projects completed and that we will have a long range plan because we know that in the midst of small projects, in the midst of submitting a statement of interest for a new facility, uh, whatever that ends up looking like, um, we still have to have a long range plan that addresses all the other issues um, that are outlined in the capital review that we had done by DRA. So that's more of like a three pronged goal, mm -hmm. if you will, around our mm -hmm. facilities and our last goal is is focused on student learning if you think about the presentation or review we just did on data that was kind of the the the, the why and this is kind of the how right and this is like what we're focusing on and how we're planning on doing it um, and the the concept here the the focus here is that we are remaining committed <laughs> and i've said this every year and we're trying like heck and i'm not going to oh, stop trying all. All means all, that's right. Um, we're committed to moving every single student in our system. Specifically, we're looking to increase at least 10% in our meeting and exceeding uh, numbers in ELA math and science. And we are looking to get back to the 50th percentile of growth. Just an interesting point in the growth piece. Um, <coughs> we were just having this conversation recently. You know, usually your state average, your growth average is 50. Makes sense, right? Um, that wasn't the case this year. You may have noticed that yeah. the growth was much lower. Yeah. It was I think in the 30s, 30, um, 38, which is a which is a major problem from that perspective in terms of statewide performance. And I only mention it because we have to get back to at least the 50th growth percentile. Um, so that was why we set a, a target um, that might seem assertive or aggressive, but it's it's we must. Um, and then, of course, the how of this is to implement our current strategy that we have. And this, the specifics of that strategy will be before the school committee at our next meeting on the 28th. 
uh, when our principals and leadership teams present their school improvement plans, which are incredible, I have to say, uh, having already had a, a preview at the work that our instructional leadership teams, coaches and principals are already doing. All of this will absolutely come to life when you hear and see their plans because it's, it is much more tangible and actionable in terms of what does it look like for the student sitting in this classroom or the teacher uh, you know, leading this classroom. You will see all those plans laid out. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do need a, if the committee um, is interested, I do need an approval for the goals. Oh, I okay. motion that we approve the goals as stated. Any discussion? Anything anybody wants changed, added, deleted? <laughs> Add a few more. At me for? <laughs> oh, I'm looking all over, all over. All, all, all around the room. No, all right. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and with that approval, I will do a short video and I will send uh, the video out to families tomorrow, talking through you know, briefly each one. Right. And uh, they'll be posted on our website as well. Okay, okay thank you. Um, and then just a quick update, our Blueprint uh, 2.0 work is moving right along. Um, we are scheduled with the leadership team to do a workshop um, on November 2nd, similar to the one that we did mm -hmm. with the school committee at, the, at our last meeting. Um, we also have continued with our partner alignment work. So uh, those individuals that are working in our schools and supporting our teachers and leadership teams, we had our second partner meeting yesterday, uh, which Matt and Jill facilitated. It went incredibly well. I've heard just really positive feedback from all three groups about how it's helping them align their focus with our schools and our, and our teachers. Um, that's important because that work will be directly uh, shaping and, and reflected in our next version of our blueprint. And uh, Carrie is looking to return uh, to the school committee to do another workshop uh, at the end of January. So I think it's the 27th meeting, which I know we can talk more about that, but. Um, so I'm sharing all those pieces to know that this work is moving full steam ahead. Uh, once we get through the conversation with the leadership team, we'll be taking the show on the road and starting to have conversations with teachers, families, and our uh, governance, local um, town governance. Um, and we're starting discussions with uh, teachers, uh, more informal conversations. Uh, Matt, Jill, and I, over the next two weeks, we're going to be having a coffee and check-in with the staff in every building um, before the students arrive and getting a feel for what's working, what's not, where they think we should be going next. So more informal, but we're starting that ball rolling uh, in the next two weeks. So I just wanted to give a quick update there. Any questions on that? Thank you. All right. And then just the... Food service. Yeah, food service. So there's a motion in front of us to Increase the food service substitute uh, from thirteen fifty to fourteen dollars an hour. If, uh, if I may, did we not do this two months ago? We did. Was it the regular food the service? The regular sub rate. Um, yeah. But I, but so um, I had a question about that. It was that. the regular. It was our full time. Or it was the full time food yeah. service a, salary scale. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'll entertain the motion. So, motion, or do I need to read it? Okay. Yeah, uh, no, I'll, I'll read it before <laughs> I say it, but I, I can, but go it's, um, <laughs> So I don't have an issue with this. I'm all for this and, and then some. I think we do need to be, to start approaching the $15, which is, you know, what is seeming to become the rate that you can get at most places um, my concern with this is is our uh, if we ask somebody to sub as a teacher isn't it eighty five dollars yep twelve dollars an hour what twelve dollars an hour well if it's six hours it's fourteen dollars oh, six hours but it's like why would i 
I'm same question be in the cafeteria. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I don't have an issue with this. As a matter of fact, if the finances can support it, I would be supportive of higher. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we have to look at the daily teacher mm -hmm. rate. Yeah. Because I hate to think that if you're in the high school, you're making less money than the cafeteria. So. And I'm glad we're mentioning that. Is it okay to jump in on that? Yes, it is. Uh, because the, if you, as you know, the food service budget just sustains itself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a, a, I wouldn't say no impact because we know in the past when they have run and we've right. in the red and we we've to had to transfer money over. So yeah. I don't want to say it's no impact. Although we, I think we can say confidently it will be no impact <laughs> to us at least this year, mm -hmm. uh, probably next to, um, frankly. But um, the other piece around the the day to day substitutes for our buildings, I would agree we need to increase the rate. That's just a bigger budget conversation. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason that this is in front of you and the other yeah. one's not. Yeah. So please yeah. know it's yeah. very important to yeah. us as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we would concur. I would love to increase the. Yeah. I, I just the rate. I call it up to be a cafeteria sub. A lot easier. Um, all right. Any other discussion? Okay, there was a motion by Sarah, seconded by Erin, for food service to increase the hourly rate for cafeteria substitutes from thirteen fifty to fourteen dollars an hour. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. That concludes my report. Okay. Uh, school committee members, anyone have anything they want to share? I missed the volleyball. So what did we learn about volleyball? Their tournament starts when? Um, it was shared with us that the the volleyball team made the playoffs right. for the first time in our our school's history. Oh, ever? The, pro the program oh, wow. only started in 2012. Okay. I think. okay. Um, but I do know that they have a phenomenal record for this year. So yeah. um, I asked when if there was a schedule yet. She said that. She doesn't know the schedule, but that she does know the games start after Halloween. I asked if there would be any home games, and she thinks possibly. Oh, wow. um, and she also mentioned that they have their senior games tomorrow. Volleyball is 5 p.m. And field hockey is 3.30. Field hockey is 3.30. Thank you. I will watch, but thank you for That's very exciting. Anyone? You still need trunker trunkers or whatever it's we called? We do need people if they want to decorate a trunk. Trunks. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the 23rd of October. Yep. We Contact give the candy. You don't need to make candy. Just decorate what your trunk. What's that? Bepo 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 it sounds like Mento, Mentos. <laughs> All right. Uh, our upcoming meetings, as have been mentioned, um, our next school committee meeting, October 28th, November 2nd, there is a uh, meeting of uh, capital planning, which will be followed by an informational presentation session to town committees, school committee, and any interested people who want to learn what the capital sub planning subcommittee is proposing um, to submit and then on our November 18th we will start early uh, with a public forum on that presentation. If no one has anything else I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. <laughs> 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 um, I need the yellow